we have reached the appointed hour. I'll call the meeting to order at 5.31. I'll read the standard opening statement. This is the Northampton Conservation Commission for the 12th of September, 2024. The commission is a group of unpaid volunteers who work to protect the natural environment of Northampton. We are concerned with the eight interests defined in the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act, and our duties also include open space acquisition and management. We operate in a way that's consistent with open meeting law requirements. All meeting dates, times, and agendas are posted in advance, and we invite public comment during our meetings. However, we ask the public to limit their comments to issues that are within our purview. Today's agenda includes requests for determination of applicability to determine if a septic system replacement is subject to the Wetlands Protection Act or the City Wetlands Ordinance, uh, this on Sylvester Road, and a continuation of a notice of intent for a 12-unit cluster development uh, of, uh, on, uh, off of 8 View Avenue. Uh, first item, is there any general public comment that does not have to do with the case before us this evening? Uh, I see uh, Jacqueline. Hi, good evening. Thank you. Uh, Jacqueline McCraner, Northampton, Massachusetts. Northampton's climate resiliency needs and housing infill development wishes do not have to be at odds. However, when the city pushes for new infill housing development... Government, this, this sounds like it has to do with the case before us, uh, the infill case. I've separated so can... my comments into general and specific. Uh, why don't you wait and do the, whatever you want to do when we're actually discussing this case? Well, this is a general comment. Um, yes, we've. Uh, I've I've seen your letter that they need not be in those needs need not be in conflict. Uh, what else do you want to add? Um, well, I respectfully request to uh, be allowed to to complete my my general comment. All right. Uh, one of the things when we have a lot of uh, public comments potential, uh, we I want to affirm that the longstanding city practice of a three minute maximum per person. Uh, although I don't have a, uh, a stopwatch, I will try to adhere to that. Please go ahead. Okay. When the city pushes for new infill housing development on land that is too wet and unsuitable for building and on land which actually serves to protect residents and wildlife with the innumerable benefits of irreplaceable natural resources, such as significant urban forests and wetlands, from extreme flooding, extreme heat, air pollution, and groundwater pollution. There are going to be rational concerns and appropriate pushback from residents. In instances where the city chooses to pursue unsuitable development in saturated low-lying neighborhoods with excessively high water tables at the expense of the well-being of existing residents, new residents, the city as a whole, and wildlife, it seems to residents that city officials have abandoned their responsibility to the public's health, safety, and general welfare. Flooding, mold, and mildew, and seriously incapacitating respiratory issues all go hand in hand. Excessive heat that goes unmitigated by mature tree canopy results in increased instances of pedestrian, jogger, and cycling-related heat stroke, as well as greater energy consumption and higher utility bills. Northampton has less than 57% mature tree canopy remaining citywide in an era of intensifying and extreme climate change. This generally low percentage of remaining mature tree canopy is bordering right on the danger line for maintaining a sustainable community in light of global warming and global climate crises, local climate crises. Northampton's Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan Update, or NHMPU, used to to cite the importance of significant trees and wetlands in sustaining Northampton's climate resiliency. Unfortunately, in 2008, under Mayor Higgins, former planning director Wayne Fiden, and then assistant director, now current director Carolyn Mish, our city's Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan Update, or NHMPU, 
stopped including significant trees and wetlands as essential natural resources needed to fight against and protect us from climate change at the same time as the city's housing infill policy took root. This does not mean, however, that our mature tree canopy and wetlands are any less important or less essential for Northampton's climate resiliency today. In fact, our urban forests are more important now than ever before for Northampton's climate resiliency. Resilient Mass Action Team, or RMAT, is responsible for the state hazard mitigation and climate adaptation plan. Earlier this year in February, RMAT applied their climate resilience design standards tool to Northampton, which led the organization to forecast seriously alarming climate statistics for Northampton over the next 50 years, including heavy rainstorms of 10 or more inches of rainfall over a period of 24 hours and more than 30 days. Time is up. I'm afraid your time is up. Can you guys finish minutes. my sentence? more than 30 days increase in temperatures in excess of 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Our mass rankings I, for Northampton- I have to assert pressure. that when we have uh, uh, a limit, we have to apply that limit uniformly. Um, so you can continue your comments later when we're talking about a specific case. Anybody else have a general public comment not having to do with the case before us? Yes, uh, Benjamin Spencer. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Name and address, please. Sure. My name is Benjamin Spencer. I live on Rust Avenue here in Northampton. Um, just a few quick things um, that I wanted to mention. So I've been watching many of the Conservation Commission meetings on the Northampton Open Media for, you know, over the past year or so. And um, I feel like it's important to mention that I really appreciate um, how thoughtfully this body deliberates uh, the issues that are before them. Um, the meetings are really well run, and um, I often use this this group as an example of a of what I can would call like a really well functioning, um, you know, um, body uh, um, operating here on behalf of the city. So thank all of you for your work. Um, another thing I want to mention is that I'm. Um, on the leadership team uh, for the Strong Towns Northampton group. And I'm concerned there's been at least one occasion where people have sort of thrown out the Strong Towns name um, when discussing projects in the city. And I just feel like it's important for it to be known that as a group, we decided that um, no one um, is, um, is to use the Strong Towns name when they're um, discussing a project, whether they're for it or against it. That's not what the group is about. That's not, you know, and that's not that's not something that we're doing as a group. So um, just to sort of head that off, should that come up, that's um, not a thing. And also, quick to invite everybody to attend our monthly meetings first Tuesday of the month. Um, it's a lot of fun. Really interesting people. They're at the police station in the community room at seven o'clock, first Tuesday of the month. And then lastly, um, I imagine most everybody at this meeting are also interested in this evening's uh, planning board meeting that is in regards to the large vacant King Street lot, 171 to 187 King Street. There's a site plan before the planning board tonight um, for um, 30 a seconds, please. 335 parking space parking lot. Um, that's before the planning board, so I would suggest everybody uh, move on to that meeting when you're when you're done with this one. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have a general comment? If not, we'll move to uh, approval of minutes. Uh, the minutes from May. Whoop, I forget which date in May. I read May. the minutes, but what, May ninth. I ninth? think it was May. Okay. Uh, Anybody have a uh, motion to uh, approve those minutes? No. Seconded. By David, second by Paul. Any amendments, modifications? If not, uh, all in favor? Sarah, roll call. Uh, roll call on that. Melissa? Yes. Paul? Yes. Beth? Yes. Jen? Yes. David? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. You name it. Thank you. Um, now we're actually uh, 
three minutes shy. Oh, no, we're not. We're, we're right on top. Um, looking at the wrong item here. Uh, so the next uh, case is a request for determination of applicability to determine if septic replacement is subject to the Wetlands Act or the Wetlands Ordinance, uh, this on Sylvester Road. Who's, who's here to present on that? Good evening, folks. Um, my name is Erica Larner. I'm the representative for this project. Pleasure to meet you. I'm happy to jump into a general description or wait for you folks. Uh, general description, go ahead, please. All right, lovely. So this is, um, excuse me, 412 Sylvester Road in Northampton. And there is a, um, excuse me, there is a Parsons Brook is to the southwest of the property. And there's an intermittent stream that's coming down alongside. Um, it's also heading from the northeast towards the southwestern corner. Um, and BBW, that is at the intersection and adjacent to the intermittent stream. Um, this property has actually been, um, has not had, sorry, it's built in 54, and it has not had any um, septic updates since, since then. So we actually didn't have any plans for the original septic. We believe that it is a cesspit or a cesspool. Um, it is planned to be abandoned. The uh, plan was to put the leach field um, outside the 50 foot buffer in, pre sorry, prior existing lawn, backfill and reestablish the lawn um, and crush and abandon the, the cesspool pit area. So um, there is the 50 foot buffer, sorry, has already been cleared almost up to the edge of the um, intermittent stream and in the adjacent BBW. Anything else? Um, I think that's the general summary. We pr are proposing um, erosion and sedimentation controls in the form of silt fencing um, around the edge of the excavation area and then plan to seed with lawn afterwards. There is the potential because there is some work area around the leach field that we could have the potential of two to 300 square feet of um, herbaceous shrubby material that could be cleared. That would be outside of the 50 foot buffer. That would be, um, and it's all within buffer. The river itself is over 200 feet away. So it's buffer from BBW and the intermittent stream. And this evening, we are not asking to confirm the delineation. We are only asking to see if the installation of the leach field and restoring it to lawn would be subject to um, requiring a notice of intent. Right. Questions from commissioners? What happens to the cesspool? They are generally crushed in place and filled with clean fill and then also um, put, sorry, grassed and lawned over. If it's um, easy to locate, they'll follow the pipe and any structures will be crushed in place and filled with clean fill. And it's a lot of topsoil removed in the process and then after it's excavated, put back um, to cover the area. What happens with the excavated soil? In general, what we find is that it would be um, the lower substrates that would be removed. The actual topsoil itself would be put back in place. Um, the They would remove some of the deeper, more like BC layers to put in clean Title V sand. Um, we would be happy to either put, make sure that that is put back over in the lawn area or remove it from the site, if the, whichever the commission prefers, that if there is excess material, we can either have a slight mounding or we can remove it from the site. Okay. It's a it's a pretty small amount of material, so I don't think it's difficult for us to manage. Yeah, thank you. Is the uh, is cesspool been recently or currently in use? And does it have to be pumped first? That I am not entirely aware of. I do know this was in front of the Board of Health and they did discuss the um, the affluent concerns at that particular hearing. Um, I wasn't involved in that. So in terms of whether or not that will be pumped prior to crushing, I don't do septic repairs. I would imagine that that is the procedure and the Board of Health would require that rather than leaving it there. Um, <clears throat> I can't see a way that that would be um, that affluent and human waste would be allowed to remain there and just shoved in. But 
I think that that's also a perfectly appropriate con condition to put onto a determination to please make sure that all materials are pumped and removed to the maximum extent practicable prior to crushing the existing system. Yeah, that would seem like uh, uh, illogically yep. correct and I'm, way to yep, approach and, the sea fence. Right? Yeah. And, Any and other questions from commission? So sorry, sir. That's all right. Any other questions from commissioners? I, I think I understand correctly that the actual septic uh, will be in the buffer zone, but the leach field will not be in the buffer zone. The leach field is a part of the septic system right. that we're installing, and mean, yes, that is proposed to go between the 50 to 100 foot buffer. So it's in the buffer, but outside of the 50 foot, no touch. Okay. okay yep. Yeah. So the septic tank is is in the buffer, but not not the leach, the 50 foot. You buffer. know, I'm not sure if the tank itself is. I would have to look at the plan right now as we're speaking and double check. Would you like me to? Sure. All right. Sorry, because I make weird faces while I'm trying to look on the screen. Yes, so the tank is proposed to come out the rear of the house. That will be also outside the 50 foot, but inside the 100 foot buffer. So it's proposed to come from the rear and head towards the back of the lawn towards the leach field, yes. If, um, if it's okay, I'd be happy to share this portion of my screen and, and show you what I'm referring to. Please. Sure, right. yes. Let's take a look. Okay. Thanks. Um. Here we go. All right. So if you can see, here is our septic tank and our leach field. And this is Sylvester Road. It is not oriented in a convenient um, position. Let me, I can do that and rotate it for you folks so it's easier. All right, so this is oriented so that Sylvester Road is up top. And yep. here is the house. The septic tank is proposed to come out the back, have the tank for a clean house, and the leach field come down here. And we did investigate the possibility of attempting to move it further away from the resource areas. But as you can see, we have the 100 foot well radius that goes right along here. So this is really the only area that a leach field could go because of the pre-existing well, which is that line right here. Okay, any other questions from commissioners? They have a 100 foot radius from the neighbor's well, but not from the well on this pump. Uh, not from the well. I I am not sure because that is a title high regulation, but I believe there may be a different regulation for a step back from your pre-existing well to somebody else's well. Um, <clears throat> I don't uh, regulate, I'm sorry, I don't do work with title five. So I'm not really sure about that particular uh, regulation for effluent. I know that it's there to protect the, the um, human waste from entering somebody's drinking water but I am not 100% sure, or how about not at all sure why it's different on your property versus the neighbors, but I do know that this was the only location. Um, the other issue is that if we started to move it further down, we could start coming into the buffer for the BBW or riverfront to Parsons Brook, and we really wanted to avoid that as well. So we could have slid further down here, then we might've hit some property line setbacks, um, I think that that was a really, really narrow area that we could possibly put it. Well, the uh, septic setback requirements from the well is not really a conservation commission, uh, an item within our purview. Um, 
but yeah. uh, I don't know if I don't know if Sarah, do you know the answer to that? Whether one's own well pre-existing has a different setback? Um, it shows where the fifty-foot line radius is for the well that goes with this house, but. Uh, yeah, I was just looking at that. There's a, a different setback for the um, the septic tank holding holding tank itself versus the leach field. So that may be the, the issue here. Perhaps. And I wonder if there is a preference that if you have a site that you are really struggling to do an upgrade on, if there is, um, you are allowed to, say, impact your own well more than you are somebody else's, that if you're going to take a risk, it's on your own property rather than to somebody else's property. I am, I would imagine that might be the thought. And uh, and it's, so it, the 50 feet shown from the private well would be to the, the, uh, the septic tank holding system itself, which, which is allowed. Um, but yeah, there, there are, there are ways to, um, to get. I didn't know if it was required of the fairings. But the the board of health would was fine with with this application yeah. was approved by the council. I was going to say that's 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 a different committee than uh, ours, but uh, it's just a curiosity question. Um, Any I other questions from commissioners? I apologize Melissa, for you... being a little dense here, uh, Erica, but I I'm seeing the I see where the uh, silt fence is that's to be reinforced with straw bales. Uh, and then there's an arrow for the 50 foot setback um, uh, that seems to be put, pointing at that fence rather than the 50 foot setback. I think the 50 foot buffers, I mean, 50 foot uh, buffer is um, the dotted line. Is that correct? I believe that does dash appear to and be, dotted yes. line. Yeah. Right. So and then, then this is. Um... Shoot, I can't remember the name of this area here. It's a. Well, it's a raised system, so it's. It will be slightly raised. Yep. Yeah, it looks like the boundaries of the raised system. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it looks like we have the 9.29 is right here. And then the first increased elevation would be, yes, you are correct. There is a tiny bit here. Right. So if we uh, go back yeah. to the tank, the location of the tank itself by the house. Oh, yes, that is here. Yeah. OK, so are, that was not dense. That was we just weren't using this, the right language together. Yeah. Here we go. OK, OK. So I guess the issue at hand then is uh, during the excavation process about protecting uh, with the soil removal and erosion, et cetera. <clears throat> yes, I think that is the main concern is that during the excavation, making sure that none of the soils enter any of the resource areas, um, happy to do distal fencing. Um, mm -hmm. And to one of the commissioner's previous concerns about the excess material, um, my apologies, I had forgotten that this was raised and that there is likely to be, they will likely need that material to create that mapping um, uh, okay. or happily remove it from the site um, or grade it in and turn it into lawn. We wouldn't leave stockpiles of soil. Yeah. Any other questions from commissioners? No. Uh, any questions from members of the public? If not, uh, someone want to make a motion um, for uh, this uh, determination of uh, applicability. I think I'm looking at this would be a if if we agree that uh, um, this is permittable, uh, it would be a, a, a determination by checking box three, uh, which is yeah, it's uh, box three, Sarah. The exact language is um, it uh, is within er an area, but will not dredge, fill, or alter. Is that the Correct language. Am I remembering that? So that would indicate that the work is within the buffer zone, but would not remove dredge, fill, or alter. Yeah, okay. 
Uh, someone want to make a motion to that effect? Uh, uh, uh. Well, I'll move that we um, entertain that. I'm happy to second. Made and seconded. Uh, any further discussion from commissioners? If not, uh, all in favor. Uh, Sarah, roll call. Roll call. Roll. Melissa? Uh, yes. Paul? Yes. Beth? Yes. Jen? Yes. David? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you very much, folks. I appreciate it. And um, Sarah, happy to accept that um, a digital version. And if you felt like the hard copy coming um, to me, that'd be fine. I can send it over to the estate because they're not there at the moment. Great. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, folks. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next case. This is a notice of intent of continuation from a couple of weeks back. Uh, for a 12-unit cluster development uh, off the end of 8 View Avenue. Um, and before we start that case, I, I want to make a statement. We've received hundreds of pages uh, from people in the neighborhood and elsewhere about this project. For the most part, I applaud your efforts. Uh, the research uh, that people have done, the effort that has gone into this, Many of the letters have been well done. But I have to also say that we have been accused by some of showing favoritism toward builders. And some letters have asserted that if we do not reject this project, we will be, quote, acting with hostility and aggression toward the people in the neighborhood. That we will be, quote, negligent in our responsibilities. I am disappointed in the tenor of those letters. Such personal attacks and assumptions of poor character have no place here. Our son's a civics teacher, a high school civics teacher, public school teacher. So here's a brief civics lesson, a partial civics lesson. The city of Northampton has 30 committees and commissions and virtually all of the members of all of those groups are volunteers who care about the city, and care about the area of responsibility that is the focus of the committee they've decided to volunteer for. This is what the democratic governance practice looks like. Most of the work of city government is done by these citizens. There is no power elite, there's no back room, it's just us, members of the community, doing the best we can. In the time of Trump, it has become normal at the national level for some people to focus on grievance and to assume that there are coordinated, conspiratorial, nefarious efforts afoot when something isn't going the way they want it to. Somebody's on the take or somebody benefits personally from their role. I like to think that here in Northampton, we're better than that. I like to think that here in Northampton, we assume that each other is acting out of goodwill and as part of this community, even when we don't agree. I can assure you that no one on the Conservation Commission has any agenda other than to do the best job they can. None of us benefits personally from any of our decisions ever. Most of the members and Stara, our staff person, are professional environmentalists. And those of us who are not, like me, do this work because we love the natural world and feel the responsibility to be helpful to our community. And it is frankly insulting for anybody to assume otherwise. I have no idea how the other commissioners feel about this project. We never discuss cases except during public hearings. But I can assure you that they will render their judgment solely on the basis of their evaluation of the application, the points raised by members of the public, and the provision of the State Wetlands Act and the City Wetlands Ordinance. When we get to any public comment, I ask those who have submitted lengthy comments in writing and want to speak to, and still want to speak, to state the highlights, but not to restate 
what they've submitted at great length. The longstanding Northampton practice of three minutes, as I've already said earlier, is something we'll try to adhere to. So now uh, we'll move on. Who's here to present on that case? Jeff Squire. That would be me, uh, yes. Um, off and away. So Jeff Squire from the Berkshire Design Group uh, here on behalf of Sovereign Builders. Um, Meredith Bornstein is here also um, from uh, SWCA, if there are any resource area questions. Um, and as you noted, uh, Kevin, uh, thank you for the, the comments, and um, this is a continuation. Um, I hope to just run through a, a brief presentation, um, highlight some of the updates, um, uh, some of the, address some of the major comments that have come in um, that we've you know also been privy to. Um, and um, and then just leave time, um, hopefully at the end, to, <laughs> to answer questions, listen to comments, and, and respond to those appropriately. So um, with that, uh, I will share my screen, hopefully. Um, and uh, let me just make sure I've got the right one here. Apologize. Okay. Uh, so, as noted, this project uh, is at 8 View Avenue. Um, it's parcels 25C17 and 25C12. Um, it is uh, a five and a quarter acre parcel combined. Um, it sits behind a number of homes on, um, on North Street, on Northern Ave, just to the north. Uh, the bike path um, borders the property on the western edge, and then there's a number of uh, properties and private residences with backyards um, to the south. Um, the property includes a single family home. There was a driveway. Um, there's a shed uh, yard space in the back. A um, few images here, here, just looking down this view avenue, you can see the single family home in the back. Um, behind the home, uh, mostly mown, mown lawn. There's a shed back there, um, space around in the yard, garden space. Uh, this is sort of the characteristic uh, woodland area behind it uh, that drops off into uh, bordering vegetated wetland. The north edge of the property includes a, an informal pedestrian path that connects uh, North Street um, with the bike path uh, behind a bunch of the neighborhood or residences that exist. Um, of this entire parcel, um, as you know, everyone is certainly aware, there's um, a substantial amount of, of wetland on the property, um, a little over two and a half acres. Again, five and a half or five and a quarter acre parcel, two and you know, two and a little over two and a half acres of wetland. Um, added in that 35 foot uh, protected zone um, under the Northampton ordinance, uh, consumes another uh, you know between three quarters and an acre. Um, and then there's some additional riverfront area associated with a, a stream that is culverted under the bike path that extends and then um, the old Mill River, um, which again is culverted before it, it finally outlets toward the Connecticut River. But that does have riverfront area associated with it. So that uh, that takes another three and uh, actually that entirety is three acres. So it leaves uh, one and three quarter acres available for development. Much of this is the existing home. Um, and again, just highlighting some of the previous history of this parcel, um, the wetland area obviously shown in blue. Um, the yellow is what we're calling the old uh, the old home site. Um, it uh, It's you know roughly a half acre, uh, about 8% of the site includes the home. Um, I guess the immediate uh, lawn area, the roadway that exists. Um, to the north is um, an interesting history of the property, obviously, with uh, this used to be um, a lot of the debris and construction material that was torn up and, and thrown away during the reconstruction of Market Street. Um, there's a number of piles back there. Oops, excuse me. Uh, number of piles back here. Uh, but most of that is construction debris, um, ABC material, uh, you know, asphalt. Uh, there's brick. There's concrete. 
um, primarily from the Market Street construction when that happened and the property owner at the time had allowed that dumping to occur and it's just sort of filled in and, and overgrown since then. You know, that's almost an acre, um, oops, sorry. Um, and in the lower southeast corner, I guess is what I'll call undisturbed woodland. Um, there's no structures, there's no real maintenance that occurs down there now. It's certainly not, you know, virgin forest, but um, in that in that lower pocket of the property, there is some area that um, you could you could say is undisturbed. Um, this project um, is is looking to develop uh, twelve single family. Uh, units ranging in size from just under 800 square feet to about 1,200 square feet, uh, all are two stories. Um, we've got provisions for parking, emergency access. Uh, we did receive special permit approval from the planning board, uh, I believe it was either last month or the month prior. Um, there's a couple of small bike covered, uh, bike parking uh, areas, um, utilities. It's a very modest uh, site plan that hopes to take advantage of you know, the previous home site and um, what was disturbed, you know, previously. Um, it consumes, you know, this entire development, including the existing roadway, consumes, um, you know, about 28% of the entire parcel. Um, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, and again, there's no, this is primarily, or this is exclusively a buffer zone project. Um, we are outside of the 35 foot. Uh, protected zone um, for this district. We are not encroaching. Recent plan revisions earlier on took um, some proposed work out of the riverfront area, um, but in in you know in general, this is really a buffer zone only project. Um, we have, have have not touched any resource areas, leaving roughly you know 72, 70 uh, percent of the property you know undisturbed and untouched. Um, Again, just a view of um, of the site at a different scale of the proposal. So this existing ent entry drive on View Ave would remain. This home that underlies here would would be removed, and these uh, small units would would spread um, between you know the access and the parking and the um, the wetlands further to the west. Um, these aren't units that are expected to have large. Yard spaces. These have provisions for storage in these units. Um, there's bike storage. Um, you know, this is this is modest living on a small footprint with efficiency. You know, all electric units um, is really what what this is. This project is intended to bring to Northampton is that um, you know that that housing opportunity and and um, for uh, for a residential uh, uh, opportunity that that doesn't really exist now. Um, running through, you know, quick set of plans. Um, this, you know, obviously the layout plan showing dimensions from from the various elements, sidewalks, uh, connecting the bike shelters um, to these units. Uh, the <clears throat> larger units do have a carport, um, so those are shown. And there's three of those. All the rest are smaller units. You can see uh, subsurface uh, stormwater infrastructure in the northern portion of the property. There's also a small subsurface system uh, in this in this corner of the site. Uh, one of the recent updates was, um, and this was reflected in the updated form three, was there's we are maintaining that existing trail connection that I referred to before from North Street to the bike path. Um, this inset shows um, both. Uh, actually, I don't know if it shows where it used to occur, but it used to wander across a couple of these uh, back properties. And so part of what we to to maintain compliance with the planning board regulations and special permit, this uh, trail needs to be exclusively on this property. So there are a couple of locations where we are relocating um, existing trail to stay within um, this this parcel property, the subject property entirely. Um, it's really relocating um, trail that exists in BVW now to a, a slightly different location. Um, but uh, all of that has been tabulated. It's another, um, I don't know, 300 square feet um, of BVW work that uh, some of which includes some remediation for that trail work. But all of that is a pedestrian trail, uh, 30 inches wide and um, intended to be as, as minimally invasive as possible. Um, 
the stormwater and grading plan. Um, I know there's been a lot of discussion about uh, about this, the, the concerns with high groundwater and stormwater. Um, we are collecting um, all of the roof water, all of the impervious surfaces, putting them through treatment chambers uh, or appropriate um, treatment devices. Um, they are ultimately, including the roof water, ending up in subsurface systems. So there's a large system that will be um, below the parking lot. Um, and then another system um, that is uh, associated with that further to the west under um, under what will be um, just vegetative cover over the top of that. Um, these do include emergency overflows uh, for those emergency events. Um, we and I will run through some of the stormwater standards and compliance um, uh, uh, highlights later on the slideshow, but we have received a stormwater permit. We anticipate that we'll be making a slight amendment to that uh, stormwater permit, just in light of some of the comments, um, but we've been in touch with um, Doug McDonald at the city to, to understand, you know, what the breadth of those include is primarily um, having to do with the mounting analysis associated with these, um, these subsurface structures. Uh, again, I can talk about that more, um, but otherwise it's, um, it's uh, 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 you know, a relatively conventional system in that regard. Um, utilities are pretty straightforward. Um, sanitary and water are all going out to North Street. Um, these are connecting to existing um, existing services. Um, no issues there. You know, all of those are away from the wetland areas and resource areas. Um, planting plan um, and just you know highlighting a number of um, actually everything is is native, um, non-invasive. The planting plan was updated um, since we last met to include a number of other trees and, and native plantings in both the um, that 35 foot protected zone where there currently aren't any uh, trees or vegetation. And then there's some small pockets of upland area further in uh, in the site that we're proposing to um, add some diversity with some more uh, from uh, some more uh, native tree plantings in that location. Um, yeah, just highlighting again this, you know, the overall property, five and a quarter acres, we're only developing um, a little less than uh, an acre and a half. Much of that is uh, consists of the existing roadway, home, uh, shed, lawn area. Um, so it, it really is trying to respect those these resource area boundaries and um, you know the the spatial relationship between open space and residents and and development there now. Um, you know there are a number of projects that um, prior to this that looked at uh, much denser development. So um, highlighting just one of the other um, additions since we last met is because of the. Um, lack of need for the western part of the property, um, you know, have offered up um, almost three acres uh, to be permanently protected under a conservation restriction. Um, simply drew this line because it's much easier to, to delineate a straight line than follow a, a, a wetland boundary. Um, but this is about three and a half acres of conservation property that would, uh, you know, remain protected in perpetuity. Um, the remainder would be, um, you know, limited to what development is shown. Um, but um, again, just just referencing um, some of the mitigation measures that the this project has offered up, um, given its um, you know sensitivity to resource areas and some of the comments. Um, and this this image in the in the upper right hand corner just highlights the trees that were added um, in in uh, lieu of the mitigation for that protected zone. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about um, the significant trees on site that are being removed, um, and I'm not dismissing the fact that there are a number of large trees that are being removed. Um, I think there's 25 in total. All of those are highlighted in red here. Um, every single one of these is a Norway spruce, um, some of which are planted uh, six, eight feet apart. Um, so. You know, these uh, were and still are a very common tree used to delineate uh, use areas, uh, hedgerows, windrows, uh, uh, you know, uh, vegetative breaks between property boundaries, uh, you know, similar to arborvitae, it was a plant that was commonly used. Um, most all of these occur sort of within this, what was I, I was calling the, the backyard and the wooded area. Um, 
as noted, these are you know planted close together. I'm not dismissing the significance of the size and maturity of these trees, uh, but is by no means um, you know a, a virgin native forest. A lot of these are draped in bittersweet. Um, invasives have taken hold of this property given its um, abandonment over the years. Um, there is um, yeah, just again looking at the ed edge of that of that um, of that um, maintained back portion of the property, um, uh, just primarily lined with invasives and, and bittersweet and getting further in, you know, a lot of these trees, because of the density that at which they were planted at, um, there really is very little to no, um, you know, needle or vegetative growth until you get to the very upper canopy of those trees. So, um, you know, while they they are impressive and in their size and, and caliper, um, you know they they are not the uh, healthiest trees and and again just adding to the complexity of all while they are not considered an invasive tree they are on these watch lists Hampshire County oddly enough is you know in this white spot right here which doesn't have any reports but there are some smattering you know uh, reports of uh, invasive tendencies and so just again being cognizant of you know, what we're planting and replacing, um, you know, similar to uh, removing Norway maples or some of the other, you know, semi-invasive trees um, in the area now, um, you know, I certainly respect and understand the significance of these large trees, um, but just wanted to add some, um, you know, add some uh, uh, depth to the conversation, I guess. Um, again, just looking at a variety of scales where this sits in the overall um, you know, urban forest that's been talked about, um, you know, this this upper image in the upper left um, at, at a, um, you know, much uh, a larger scale shows the development relative to, you know, a lot of the green space that it abuts. And just backing up, it really does continue to stay at the fringe of that larger, um, you know, uh, 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 greenway, if you will. Um, you know, understanding that infill is is um, you know a sensitive topic and and is appropriate in the right places, but when you consider the amount of you know development that surrounds this, the green space that's being preserved, um, you know it's um, you know it's it's really a site that um, it would serve well for you know to, to, to assist in some of the housing needs. Um, we, oops, I'm sorry, um, what else have I got here? So just looking at, um, just talking about some of the stormwater concerns and just to add, um, again, a little bit of um, depth to the conversation, um, respective to groundwater and where this stormwater system sits relative to foundations and uh, floor elevations. So, um, in the bottom here is a is a rough pro cross section cut through what you can see in this in this uh, plan above, um, trying to just capture as much of the site from the property line to the wetlands as we could. So um, the red is is the existing grade. Uh, the blue below here uh, along the bottom is um, the seasonal high groundwater. So this is you know this is measured. At the at the highest possible you know time during the season through um, uh, through soil uh, through soil analysis we've got uh, I don't know no less than nineteen different test pits that we've collected on this property over the years that we've you know that at least Berkshire has been involved in this project so we've got a fair amount of soil data um, from the last you know five six eight years um, and you know we've done um, we've done it as recently as last year. Um, this subsurface stormwater system that is in the northern part of the property, um, you know, by uh, state stormwater standards needs to be a minimum of two feet above seasonal high groundwater. So that sits, you know, roughly at this elevation here. Um, there's obviously some amount of fill that is being brought in. Um, so to, to level out these, um, these pad areas for these units, um, again, not encroaching on the uh, 35 foot uh, protected zone, but this is um, which, you know, would be roughly in this location, uh, but that puts these uh, floor elevations, again, three feet or so above that subsurface system. So, you know, thinking about it in layers, we have, you know, we have considered the separations needed and the groundwater and what that does um, and where that, you know, 
uh, bleeds out on the site given the various elevations. Um, obviously, as you move further west, the grade drops and it and then it, it flattens out again. But that's where the the BVW area is. Um, and um, yeah, just with respect to the stormwater standards, um, you know, understanding that you have purview over the um, DEP uh, stormwater standards. Um, I just thought I'd touch on these real quick, just to um, you know provide some um, you know some understanding of of compliances and what these standards are. Oops. Um, so standard one is that there's going to be no untreated uh, discharges. There's certainly no untreated discharges. Um, all the stormwater, it's 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 um, exclusively um, sediment removal. So in this case, all of these um, discharge points and emergency disflows are all are all treated. Uh, peak grade attenuations, that's the need for these uh, subsurface systems is to attenuate during these large storms. So um, calculations for pre-development um, uh, or post-development do not exceed those of pre-development. And that's what those subsurface systems are for. Um, recharge, as I noted, we are, um, we are required to provide recharge. Um, there are volume calculations that were provided um, one of those because of the depth of groundwater required a mounting analysis and we're working through some you know final comments and is issues that were um, uh, brought up in a, in a peer review letter um, with the city uh, DPW. Um, we don't expect that that's going to change this system at all at all. It's a function of where the different invert elevations are and and how the system drains out. Um, but we, um, you know, we've been busy and and speaking with the DPW to iron that out, and that that um, that that recharge and water quality are, are combined. Um, and so the water quality piece, sorry, the water quality piece um, under the standard four is that we both have to have a long term pollution prevention plan uh, that was included with the stormwater report that requires maintenance on all the stormwater features. Um, there does there is um, you know the treatment chain that's required to demonstrate uh, TSS and nutrient removal um, and again this is tied with the amended stormwater permit that we're working through the DPW with uh, standard five uh, addresses land uses with higher uh, potential pollutant loads this is not residential use is not a use that generates high pollutant loads um, under these regulations um, there's no discharges to critical areas as defined by DEP. Uh, redevelopment uh, of projects. Um, so this this project is a combination of new and redevelopment. Um, and in, in overall, I would just summarize that the treatment for all of the stormwater uh, exceeds what would be required typically. So um, if we were just required to treat the new development, um, we would uh, greatly exceed that. This project treats both the new development and a large portion of the existing development. So um, we certainly um, meet these standards um, above and beyond what's required. Um, there's a construction period pollution prevention plan. This is the SWIP. Um, it's going to be quite, it's required as uh, per the stormwater permit. Um, per DEP regulations before any construction uh, activity begins on the site. So that will be something that needs to be uh, developed, but a large uh, portion of the erosion control plan is included in the stormwater report, but a final uh, full SWIP will be submitted to the DPW and the city uh, for review and approval prior to, prior con to construction. Um, there is also an operation and maintenance plan uh, included with stormwater report. Uh, that includes post uh, construction operation maintenance, as I as I mentioned before, um, and there's a long term long term pollution prevention plan, um, and there are no illicit discharges here. Um, this is this is typically for groundwater injections and and projects or uses that um, would um, would discharge illicit um, um, illicit discharges, and there are there are none associated with this project. This is probably, this is exclusively stormwater. Um, and lastly, just share a couple of images of what um, you know the, the architectural renderings of um, of the project. Um, you know, I think what is unique about this that we've tried to hold true is that the value of these units not only is in their efficiency and their small footprint, but they do back up against um, you know valuable. 
um, you know, urban woodland. And that that is that is the value. These don't have large lawn spaces. Um, you know, the patios shown in the back of these aren't even a reality because it does drop off fairly steeply behind these units. So these are these are you know, places where you might get a lawn chair um, directly against the unit, but they're mostly meant to be enjoyed from the balconies, from the windows. Um, you know, we've got, um, we did include something that I missed um, is we are including uh, markers along, um, along the boundary of, um, you know, of the wetlands. So these, we've got granite, uh, you know, low granite bollards along those that wetland boundary to delineate that. This is conservation mix. You know, this is intended to be, um, you know, an area that is nestled into nature, not with uh, large expansive lawn spaces. So um, really trying to, um, you know, uh, take advantage of this, of the, the opportunities on this site. So um, with that, I will stop my rambling, answer any questions that you might have and, and go from there. Questions from commissioners? Well, I have, go ahead, I have go. one, uh, if I can go. Um, <clears throat> I'm no hydrology expert by any means, but I'm wondering what the emergency overflow plans look like. Uh, you probably already discussed them, but um, spell them out for me a little uh, more closely. Sure. So, you know, these systems are designed um, by standards to meet the 100-year storm event. Um, when there are events beyond that, there is some capacity that will be exceeded in those. And so we need to design a way that, you know, um, takes into consideration those storm events in a way that doesn't cause erosion or, you know, put, put, um, put stormwater flows going in directions that we don't want. And right. so um, as part of that, these systems include, you'll see one in this upper corner, um, they're what's called a level lip spreader. It's essentially there's an outlet pipe at the top of the system that allows those you know large storm events to empty out of there. There's a level lip spreader, which is essentially a stone, a flat stone, shallow flat stone basin that, that takes pipe flow, um, which is concentrated flow, converts it to sheet flow, and puts it over a, a level, um, you know, curb or some level, you know maintained level surface. So it converts to sheet flow and back into the woodland. So there's one in this location. Um, there's also one in this location. The reason I ask is because I'm convinced that with climate change, we're going to get hit with 10 inch downpours from time to time. And, mm -hmm. you know, the streets in Northampton do get clogged from um, time to time with these events. And I just wonder how this area would withstand that kind of um, rainfall. Sure. No, it's a valid question. I, you know, I, there are certainly more frequent large storm events. Um, you know, I will note that the DEP requirements for, um, for the volumes considered in those storm events did change this year on a state level. And so mm -hmm. at least we're using, you know, higher, higher rainfall amounts, uh -huh. um, you know, in, in to account for, for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there are, will, there will be always, storm events that exceed, you know, the design of any stormwater system. It's just a, you know, there's, um, uh, it's just, you can't design for those, um, you know, those historic events or some of those events, but this certainly meets or exceeds, you know, any of the requirements on a city or, or, or state standard, at least. Okay. Yeah, uh, in that regard, I wonder if the seasonal high groundwater level will be higher in the near future. Mm -hmm. Um, again, that's something that is hard to predict, um, but we know it's going to happen. Jen, you had a question? Yeah, um, thank you. Um, will you speak to if um, what or if the plan is for any of the invasives management in the hmm. proposed resource area and sort of adjacent to the development? I mean, certainly within the development area, um, you know, all of the invasives will, um, you know, will have to be removed. Um, they'll come out with either the, you know, trees that they're growing on now or the soil that they're they're growing in. Um, we're not proposing any work inside the wetland areas. Um, you know, I don't know whether, 
you're very familiar with it, but um, there's, you know, it's it's got a history of, of um, um, you know, just redevelopment, I guess, between the railroad coming through and the bike path and the homeless shelters. And so there's, um, there's a number of invasive species back there. And I don't know if there's any effective way to, you know, eradicate all of those. Um, certainly within the confines of, you know, this project boundary, we would maintain those and, you know, I presumably on the project edge as well that abut, you know, neighbors, um, cause there'll be shared, um, you know, shared buffers there, shared, um, shared landscape. So I would imagine, um, you know, just as they are now that the desire would be to, you know, maintain that in a way that isn't overrun by, um, invasives, but, you know, as, as to the, the deeper wetlands further to the West, I, I think it's going to be a little bit more challenging out there. Yeah, I'd like to say something to that. The the oriental bitter squeed especially um, is a very aggressive invasive. I I did a lot of um, wetland consulting when I was working for an engineering company, and I've seen oriental bitter squeed take down a seventy foot maple mm -hmm. by just the sheer mass of the, uh, the bitter sweet plant get up to four inches in diameter for the vine mm -hmm. with so much weight and when the storm comes along one of your photos you show a lot of the bittersweet on one of those uh 70 foot high uh yeah norway's yeah it is. and something like that with, with in a big windstorm that much mass added to it Go right down. That's uh, it's a pretty big concern. And that seems to be probably the most the high, the uh, greater majority of the invasives in this in this very universal right up. But there there might be a way of setting up a program where you can go into the wetland. You know, we've done it before in other sites. Remove the invasive. Mm -hmm. Mostly done by hand, can't get machines. But there may be a way of getting, you know, attacking that the invasives. In the well, as as you note, a lot of it is is associated with you know some of the the Norway spruces that are there, and you know all of that at least in this area. That soil, which is you know where the root system is, and really the you know, in addition to the berries, but the root system is any of that stuff left in the ground will continue to to sprout. That all of that will need to come out just for the construction. So hopefully that will eradicate, you know, a large portion of it. Right, but you're going to have to maintenance have a maintenance plan for that anyway. Correct. Okay. If uh, if I could speak to a couple of these issues. Um, one regarding the invasives, uh, the Asiatic bittersweet, the multiflora, and some other uh, in, included in the wetlands area. Um, if part of the um, promotion, if you will, of the desirability of this project is that there will be a conservation restricted area. But if that area is not maintained in an ecological fashion and the invasives aren't controlled, then the value of that area will be seriously affected, as Mason's pointing out, uh, by the killing of, of trees that are there. So if we're going to uh, remove 26 Norway spruce, um, it seems that it would be valuable to have a program of inventorying and uh, proposed control mitigation efforts for the, for the invasives in the wetlands area. Um, so that's a thought on my part. The other thought I had, um, sorry, I'm a, a bit ill still, so um, my voice. Um, the other thought I had was I noticed in the Stormwater Authority uh, permit um, that item number seven, many of the, the, the local community members in the area are concerned about flooding, uh, as was mentioned also. Um, and I noticed that item seven said that if there is flooding, if this con project contributes to flooding, 
that that the developer will be asked to redo the stormwater management system. Uh, and I'm wondering if there's a, uh, are any ideas in place about what could be done to address what could be done additionally to address that if it does become a concern. That may be a little too complex a question for uh, uh, out of the blue, but it's a if that's a point in the uh, permit, it seems that that's something that we might want to consider. Well, and that's that's something, Melissa, that uh, we would uh, require as one of our conditions that the conditions of the uh, stormwater permit from DPW be incorporated by reference. And I had the same thought about item seven that said, hey, if it turns out that there's some unexpected at this point, but uh, if there's some actual increase in flow, that the system would have to be redesigned and reconstructed. So I think it's a fair question. Yeah, and I, I wonder how how one will assess if it's increased. Is there is there current data about flooding on on North Street? I, you know, well, it's I, not I, a floodplain. Yeah, I understand that, but that there's documented flooding on the street there that was commented upon, right? Uh, Jeff, could you go over your uh, replanting plan? I mean, you're taking 26 large trees down, are you replacing Um, We are re replacing it. I don't have, well, do I have? So a native species. Yeah, so I mean, there's a couple of things. There's, there's the city's significant tree removal uh, ordinance. Um, and so, you know, we're moving 713 of uh, inches worth we're replacing it with, um, you know, 357 inches worth. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, and um, there is some mitigation. We just don't have room, you know, entirely all on site to mitigate all that caliper inches. So um, the planting plan does include, let me see here. I'll show you the list quickly. So larger trees. Um, you know, number uh, oak species, uh, tupelo, uh, sycamore, sourwood, um, yellowwood, dogwood, musclewood. You know, a lot of the a lot of the sort of standard native native trees. Um, and again, just similar list with the um, with the shrubs. There's a handful oak leaf hydrangea. There's a couple that aren't native, um, but I think the majority are are um, certainly native or or um, you know, regional trees. Um, we are, there are two different seeding mixes. So there's a, um, a New England sort of a wildlife mix that's behind all of the units. So that's, that's that slope that, um, you know, drops off to the to wetland areas, all the space in between, um, as opposed to a, a mown lawn, we've, we've proposed a nomo fescue mix. Um, again, this is, it's a, it's a fescue variety, but it, it doesn't require, you know, a lot of the maintenance and, um, you know, some of the same, uh, concerns or challenges with conventional lawn. It's, it's meant to be much more, um, naturalized, at least in and around, you know, the, the usable space. So, um, and Jeff, the that... tree removal calculations were developed for the significant tree ordinance purposes. Um, Correct. But not all of those are within buffer zone. Is it 19 trees that are within buffer? Correct. Yeah, there's a number of those that aren't. Um, let's see if I can get there. Yeah, so all of these out here are outside of outside of buffer. And this one here. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's any that are within the 35 foot protected zone that are coming out. For someone who is not as knowledgeable about this, um, do you have a sense of how long it would take the newly planted trees to approach the same canopy level of the trees you're removing? Uh, canopy level, I actually probably wouldn't be that long. Um, you know, to reach that caliper size is a different story. Uh, you know, a, a, a 36 inch oak is going to take 100 years. Um, but because so many of these trees are so densely planted, they're the canopies on these evergreens really aren't all that large. They're 
you know, maybe 20 feet in some cases. Um, you know, there's certainly some larger ones where they've got some room to grow, but the la the vast majority are are pretty dense. So um, at least to reach that canopy, you know, it's maybe, um, I, yeah, I don't know, 10 years, depending on the species. So some of the, the trees on that list are sort of more small trees or like like the cornice yep. or the amelanchia, those. So I guess I'm trying to figure out from the planting plan, is that like a, how are, um, how are the sh sort of smaller trees distributed there? Is it are you like really replacing the canopy or is it sort of a layered thing? It's yeah. We're, so we're trying to tuck those into the existing, you know, canopy there. They're all understory trees, obviously. So they're, you know, we're trying to tuck these in on the edges of the site. Um, it's these smaller, you know, smaller tree circles. Um, we've got larger, you know, larger shade trees or trees that we're not disturbing. Um, you know, there's larger shade trees that we are proposing, but really trying to, you know, provide a layered, diverse edge there. Yeah. Um, and certainly, okay. oops, there's a number of smaller ones, you know, offered in the in the back also in this in this upland area, just because of the nature of the forest back there. A similar question uh, about transpiration. I, uh, I wonder, uh, taking down a number of large trees uh, that are currently sucking up a, a lot of groundwater uh, on mm -hmm. a regular basis, uh, do you have some sense about uh, the replacement planting plan, what kind of transpiration that will be producing at, within a reasonable, you know, first couple of years uh, compared I, to what's being removed? Yeah, I don't, unfortunately. I mean, we we tried to do some research. Um, you know, there's there's a there's a lot of lot of, lot of moving parts in this project, and certainly tried to you know touch on on all the relevant pieces. Um, you know, that that research got pretty deep and and dependent on a lot of different things. So. Um, you know, there's, there's certainly more out there, but, uh, yeah, unfortunately I don't have any, you know, data to, to support, um, you know, one, one opinion or another. Okay. But it, it is the case that trees such as willow trees are incredibly absorbing mm -hmm. of water. Yes. I don't know if they're included in the plan. No, but we are including a number of floodplain trees. So, um, you know, uh, let's see what I've got here. Sycamore is one. Swamp white oak is another. Um, Tupelo is is often a floodplain tree, but those often you know consume a little bit more water than you know upland more upland trees. So, just trying to be cognizant of what what the conditions were that they were going to be planted in, and wanted to make sure that we had something that would survive and thrive. Are you saying they they um, evapotranspirate more water than the the Norway spruce? Uh, given the canopy cover, right? Is that what you're saying? That yes. Yeah, okay. Hmm. So, is it my under is my understanding correct that um, you're only disturbing um, twenty percent of the land, or is it twenty eight percent of the site? Twenty twenty eight percent, twenty seven, twenty eight percent. Yes. And is Much it of correct? which is again just pointing out that that includes the existing roadway, the house, the you know. There's a lot of development that's there right now. Okay, and is that the case? Can you hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Uh, again, the incoming call interrupting me. Um, is it the case then that there's no land subject to flood currently, and there are no um, vernal ponds um, in the area? No. That's correct. Then yeah. Correct. Okay. All right. Can you clarify the, the sure. Beth. Um the in the renderings you said there were like the drawings of the patios. What but I'm oh. not seeing those in the plan. Is that just that's just not accurate? Right. Okay. Right. Those yeah, those were just, you know, artist uh architectural renderings for, for marketing purposes primarily. So but yeah, there's there's no patios in the site plan. Got it. Uh, another question. Um, you, you talked about the on the, the proposed conservation restriction area, uh, and you delineated it by drawing a straight line. Um, any reason you wouldn't want to do it um, uh, along the line of the undisturbed? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I'll I'll jump in from a city perspective. Uh, it's it's really difficult to monitor a conservation restriction that that has a, a curved line. Um, so that you know it could be shifted over. I, I I'm not quite sure how that was drawn, but um, it would be a, a challenge to to monitor that and and to deal with that from the okay. CR okay. perspective. Drives the attorneys nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and surveyors and our surveyors right yeah yep okay oh um jeff what's what's going to happen with that one acre of debris from the uh, market street um construction so all of that's got to get excavated um if it's not for building foundations or road base um much of the stormwater system subsurface system is under there um, and so, you know, part of the agreement is that all that material has got to be removed, um, you know, either down to virgin, um, virgin ground or, um, or removed in, in its entirety. And so that all that's going to have to go away as, as part of the construction. Got it. Okay. What's the likely elapsed time? for the entire project before you would be applying for a certificate of occupancy? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I think, you know, ideally they were looking to break ground this year. It's obviously not going to be this year. So, um, you know, I would say, you know, best case scenario would be break ground early in the spring. Um, I don't know whether there would be any units available um, by the end of that year. I would think so, but I don't, I don't know for sure. No, I realize that's a, a, a construction question, not a conservation question. I'm just curious yeah. about the length of the construction disturbances uh, that sure. would be going on. Yep. What about a sequence of construction? <clears throat> um, I mean, they would be, I imagine, demolition of the existing house and, you know, any of the structures, uh, tree removal, excavation of, you know, any of the unsuitables and getting getting the rough grades established. The stormwater system would all be, um, would all need to happen first um, to give them, you know, at least uh, uh, an accessible site to be able to start building, you know, the units. Um I don't know whether the plan would be to start in the north or the south, but I would imagine once these road bases are established that, you know, that would give them the lay down area and the access that they need to construct the individual units. And then, you know, final paving and, you know, landscaping would, would, um, you know, would follow up. But, um, yeah, I think any of the, any of the excavation and, and site work, stormwater systems would all need to be, utility systems would need to go in um, at the front, front end of the project, certainly. I would suggest maybe the replantings take place. Mm -hmm. uh, start sure. Construction of the buildings. Yep. Yeah, and I, I think they're certainly open to you know if it doesn't if it doesn't hinder access to you know future, um, you know future parts of the site uh, for construction purposes. I think all that could be done. Um, all that work could be done early on. Trail relocation could be done. You know early on. Other questions from commissioners? If not, commissioners, feel free to uh, consider other questions, but I'll ask for public comment. Um, and I will ask the members of the public who want to speak uh, both to limit their um, time to three minutes and to address the commission of uh, the standard practice is not to uh, have a debate uh, among either different members of the public or between the public and the applicant, uh, but to address your comments to the commission. Hmm. Jacqueline. Thank you, Jacqueline McCraner, Northampton, Massachusetts. Uh, vernal pools were identified and 
documented and reported to the Conservation Commission on August 23rd of 2007. So there is a previous history of vernal pools on the property. Uh, spotted salamanders, whether they have yellow or blue spots, they were also uh, spotted on the property. And the uh, wetland boundary that WCA, SWCA, demarcated in July of 2023 was found to have expanded beyond the blue flag uh, demarcation line as of December 2023. Uh, the proposed project at 8 View Avenue would decimate at least 27 significant Norway spruce trees living in the 100 foot wetland buffer zone. This would cause a whole host of serious and complex issues in the buffer zone where the majority of the construction work would occur, including watering up of the site, meaning the water table that is already approximately just 12 inches below grade in places on the property would rise even higher. The water tables could rise by as much as 7.9 inches if the buffer zone were deforested on top of rising water tables due to climate change. This irreversible damage to the buffer zone would inevitably negatively impact the BVW themselves. Residents have seen that the applicant's original stormwater drainage report failed to protect the interests of the wetlands under the state's wetlands protection regulations 310 CMR 10.01 part two purpose and failed to comply with two of the mass DEP stormwater standards. I am not confident the current site plan can adequately address the rising water tables and increasing stormwater runoff due to climate change. Pursuing a housing infill development project on a filled wetlands, something that our Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan Update or NHMPU used to warn against is a terrible idea because filled wetlands lead to shifting slab on grade foundations, cracked driveways, mold and mildew growth with subsequent respiratory health issues, soil erosion and sedimentation, increased velocity of stormwater runoff, downstream flooding, and much more. The significant Norway spruce forest and the wetlands at 8 View Avenue are my neighbors and my last line of defense in an increasingly saturated and hot low-lying neighborhood. Our our heat and flooding nightmares are only getting worse with climate change. We're surrounded by the hottest areas in the city, including downtown Northampton, King Street, the Northampton Industrial Park, and Interstate 91. Our neighborhood has some of the highest water tables with the land at 8 View Avenue flooding regularly in heavy rainstorms. Even the highest points of elevation on the land were flooded during Tropical Storm Floyd in 1999. Your three minutes is up. Thank you. Anybody else want to make a comment? I see Jane Myers. Jane Myers, 74 Straw Avenue in Northampton. The Eight View Project violates the mandates of the Northampton Multi-Hazard Mitigation Plan of 2020 to 25, passed by the City Council in 2020. The plan officially states the city's mission to prioritize prevention of flooding and tree removal affecting our urban woods. Also, the 8 View Avenue development presents an exception to the Wetlands Protection Performance Standards 33710B adopted in Northampton in October 27, 2007, when the city amended the state standards to prioritize infill and thus weakened the standards for wetlands. The inf term infill created a hole and um, our city's amended standards state that now building can occur up to 35 feet from the wetlands, not 100 feet. But it says in the amended standards of Northampton, quote, this happens because, quote, to encourage infill development, which is considered more sustainable under the principles of smart growth and, and listen to this, 
generally has a smaller environmental footprint than developing in, out, in outlying areas. But with the word generally, it tells us there will be exceptions. Given the clear significant impact the Eight View Pro Avenue project would have on the wetland, the consequent heat index of the area, the flooding, the Eight View Avenue development would not have, quote, a smaller environmental footprint than development in outlying areas. Even though Eight View Avenue is in the URB and not in the outlying areas, it is not the usual property. It's an exception, a mostly pristine forested haven, something precious for our city adjacent to the wetland within an already densely populated mixed income area that has a relatively that already has a relatively low tree canopy this property deserves to be excluded from our weakened infill performance standards in urban areas therefore in this case the commission should follow the state dep wetland performance standards which requires much more protection of the buffer zone to bordering vegetative wetland. 30 seconds. Thank you. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Kevin, Anybody if I could else? just clarify, because I think it's important that the Northampton Wetlands Ordinance is stricter in all areas than the state act. Uh, it, it's not actually legally possible for a commission to have uh, lower standards than the state act. Hmm. Right. They, the home rule uh, uh, allowance is only for restrictions that are greater than the state standards. Thanks for the clarification, Sarah. Anybody else? If not, um, are we ready to close the hearing or uh, commissioners, if we close the hearing, then uh, we're saying that we have enough of in information. Is there any um, additional information we would want from the applicant that might cause us to continue the hearing rather than to close it? I thought that Sarah had some items. Um, I'm trying to find them. I can't remember what they were for. I, I believe that uh, one of them was uh, the stormwater pollution prevention plan, being sure that that's included as an order of condition. And uh, also uh, that there be an assessment of the plantings two years after they're planted. Okay, well, that's uh, and standard. That be re replanting. Is, is that the, the sort of thing you were thinking, Mason? Oh, uh, there was a submittal and approval of the uh, SWIP. Yeah, Sarah. Yes, water so, um, uh, pollution prevention plan, SWIP. Uh, so I'll just quickly go over what I had suggested if the commission were to um, issue an order. Um, so a, a full stamp revised plan set to be submitted, that uh, including all the detail sheets. Um, that that's fairly standard with a project and has included multiple revisions, uh, submittal and approval of the SWIP to the commission, um, specific language regarding the donating of, donating of the permanent conservation restriction, uh, the assessment of the plantings that Mason had mentioned, uh, the permanent markers installed in the 35 foot protected zone that were shown on the plans, um, <clears throat> a stormwater permit amendment to be obtained prior to the construct pre-construction meeting, uh, and all of the, the conditions that were specified in, in DPW stormwater permit just for consistency um, and, and any invasive species re removal that's considered, although it, it seems like the performance standards had, have been met and that may, that may not be something that, that the commission wished to consider given the prevalence of invasive on the site. I might disagree with that. I, I think um, invasive species within the wetlands itself also, uh, I see a member of the public now with a raised hand, Deborah. Thank you, um, Deborah Berkowitz, 59 Phillips Place, Northampton. I wasn't going to speak because I feel like I can't. Um, I've been following this. I've been following all the Northampton stuff with heartache. <laughs> and um, I guess I just want to say I, I'm 
I look carefully at what what's done with trees really around the cities around the world. The city that I'm from, Montreal, does not allow basically any public cutting of trees, even by private homeowners at this point. Um, and, and all over the world, there's such a clear movement towards understanding that trees are absolutely at the center of mitigating uh, climate change, water harm. And I have been, you know, I, I've lived in a neighborhood watching what's happened to the increased use of air conditioning and the increased flooding and the erosion when trees are being cut down. I'm watching the, the number of significant, you know, of large trees that have been cut down in Northampton over the last few years for development in favor of these two or three inch saplings. I mean, I, when I looked at that planting list and saw, you know, two to three gallons, I just, I was horrified. Like that is not the same. It's not gonna do the same for the neighborhood. And in the end, the developers leave and the people who are living in the neighborhood who have to use more air conditioning, who are dealing with sump pumps, who are dealing with all the things that happen to their property, they're the ones that have to live with it. And I can see the next one is gonna be you know, John Henzel's property on Milton. And I, I don't understand why we're, we're sitting here with these, you know, allowing this farce to suggest that cutting down mature trees in favor of small caliper saplings and bushes is not going to have a massive impact on the neighborhoods in this city. Thank you. Thank you. And I see Adam Cohen. Sir, there we go. I'm sorry. Um, I I'd be interested to hear the commission uh, address some of the specific points raised by Metro West Engineering uh, that was critical of some of the assumptions made by the applicant in classifying various soils. Uh, I would be interested to hear some more uh, addressing some of the specific points they raised since they're kind of matters of fact. Uh, it'd be good to get a consensus about what the site actually is composed of. Thanks. Can you be more specific? I'm not sure how to respond. Sure. Um, so Metro West says uh, they say the applicant improperly classifying surface soils as within hydrologic group D when USDA soil maps indicate the presence of hydrologic group A, B, and CD soils resulting in an overestimate of pre-development stormwater runoff rates and volumes. Uh, they say, please note an earlier hydrologic assessment for the same property prepared by the same consultant utilized hydrologic soil group classifications that conflict with the values selected for the current project. They have a few other points as well. Yeah. Um, Kevin, I might suggest that the, the applicant um, provide a, just a, a synopsis of the the responses to that because they did provide a, a point by point um, response to the that engineer's assessment. This this report from the other engineer was sent to um, McDonald and Company, and they went over it with them. right when they did the drainage. Yes, and you've received. Be okay, EPW. Yeah, I mean, I, I so I, mean, I can respond. I don't have all the the list of comments in front of me or the responses. I mean, I can I can generalize um, about you know some of the responses. Again, yeah, you know, we are working. We have worked through the majority of these, almost all of them, with DPW and conservation. Um, you know, uh, specific to the soil comment. So Berkshire had worked on this property for a prior developer several years ago, uh, 2008, 2009, um, done under you know different different principles, different uh, engineers. Um, the soil maps currently label these soils as a variety of A, B, and C, um, which again not to bore everybody with the details, but it just has to deal with the consistency and the the permeability of all those of uh, certain soil types. So A is better draining than C is better draining than D soils. Um, while the soil maps say one thing, uh, test pits and on-site investigations often yield different results. Those soil maps are based on, you know, um, uh, much larger scale um, evaluations and analysis. So when, you know, when we do soil test pits on site, we may adjust those 
uh, soil classifications based on what we find in the field. Um, that Market Street dumping area is a prime example. Um, you know, we wouldn't necessarily consider that to be, you know, a soils. That's a that's a construction debris. At, um, regardless of what the soil maps say, we classified everything for the purposes of our soil, um, uh, our stormwater plan as D soils, which are very poor draining. This it's the poorest draining soils that you know you can have of the of the options. So as a way to, um, uh, I guess, uh, provide a, um, a sense of um, um, uh, bounds of what we were designing to, designing to the worst possible soil type seemed, you know, an appropriate, uh, you know, um, avenue to take given the complexity of the soils and the concerns about groundwater recharge here that, um, you know, Choosing that avenue was much better than choosing a, a, a well draining soil. So, as, as an example, and that that carries through through a number of um, discussions. There's a, a mention of a mounting analysis that was provided. I think largely many of those comments were addressing the original stormwater application, which um, stormwater permit application, which you know, as as we do with any application and project of this size, work through a number of iterations with the DPW. Um, so there were subsequent revisions and updates. Um, most of those were reconciled and um, commented on by the DPW as well. So those were all um, addressed in um, in subsequent revisions. So um, you know, I would note that a lot of them, I think, were were comments that didn't pertain to the the current stormwater plan. I, I have a um, concern to ask you, Jeff. Um, could you state for the public record why it's absolutely necessary to remove 19 to 26 Norway spruces? I, I think that that's one of the most painful parts of this process for the public uh, from the comments that I've read. And I just want to be clear why that's necessary. I've seen the design and I think I understand it quite well, but uh, just for public record. I mean, if there's any redevelopment to happen on this site that avoids, you know, all of these significant trees, um, you know, anything beyond a single family home um, is going to be really challenging. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a landscape architect. I, I'm a horticulturalist at heart. I value the large trees just as much as everybody else. I don't want to dismiss, um, you know, where we're placing value on projects or properties or certain elements. Um, but again, just, you know, looking as to where these trees sit on the outskirts of the buffer zone, um, outside of wetlands, um, in mostly previously developed and disturbed area, um, to have a project that could provide, you know, some of these housing opportunities, um, you know, some reuse of this site that was, um, you know, responsible, um, some of the previous development that looked at this project had, you know, 20 units or more um, and utilized much more of the site than um, than we're proposing. So, I, you know, it's unfortunate they are where they are, um, but it's, you know, it's going to be hard pressed to really, um, you know, do much with the site without removing, you know, some or all of those. And one last question. How confident are you about, what is it, a three foot separation um, between the basins and the groundwater levels? It's, so it's DEP requires two feet of separation um, to seasonal high groundwater. So these, this is, you know, this is the highest time of the year. Um, you, you measure those levels through, um, through um, riso, through uh, staining in the soils, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's what we're looking for. And so those those high soil, those high groundwater levels, we've got to be two feet above that um, as a buffer. Um, you know, I, I completely appreciate the concerns about increased storm events, um, and um, you know that that is one reason why that two foot minimum separation is is required to compensate for. Um, you know, some of that um, increase in uncertainty, I think that there's, there is some buffer there. Um, and uh, again, we, you know, we try to be conservative with at least our stormwater designs in that, 
you know, we're not just squeaking through. We've got something that we feel confident is going to work um, and, you know, satisfies all the standards. So, um, you know, they're, they're, um, there's a number of systems that um, we've seen over the years that we've, you know, we've had to go in and repair uh, for various reasons. Um, I think, you know, as a firm, we've been pretty fortunate and in terms of, you know, the, the quality and consideration we bring to the, you know, the stormwater and civil engineering components of projects. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I certainly can't say with 100% certainty that, um, you know, groundwater isn't going to change and it won't have an impact, but um, certainly with respect to all the required standards and then some, um, you know, we, we've certainly designed this to, to address all of those, um, all of those issues. I see one, two other members of the, oh, sorry, go ahead, Paul. Just one other thing that's occurred to me as we've been speaking. I think it was Jacqueline McCraner who said that the um, groundwater level can come up to within 12 inches of the surface. And does the plan believe that to be a, um, a matter of fact? Um, some of the test pits certainly showed high groundwater. I mean, further further into the wetlands, there were test pits that were done further to the west that you know certainly had higher groundwater. That's why we don't have stormwater systems there. Um, we've yeah. we've got we've got stormwater systems where groundwater is is lower, or where we've got more cover. So by the houses, the units that are going in, the high level of the groundwater is below twelve inches significantly. Oh yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, at least in that cross section that I showed in that in that yeah. one location, the you know the floor finished floor elevation is three feet above the stormwater system, which is um, you know two feet above seasonal high groundwater. Okay, thank you. I see Jackie Balance. Uh, pl please come back to me. Let Mr. Gemma speak next. Jim. All right, Mr. Gemma. Uh, thank you. It's Gemma. Um, and Gemma. I'm a professional engineer and a professional hydrologist, and, and basically, um, I specialize in stormwater management and drainage systems and mass DEP filings, and I'm a design engineer. Um, a couple of things I will say. First of all, um, the consultants, I guess, have posted a new stormwater analysis that's gone on the website, I believe, Monday. It's a fairly complicated project, and that does not leave me sufficient time to have reviewed that documentation and be in a position to speak to you folks intelligently tonight. Um, but that said, as you presented tonight, I skimmed through the report. And one thing I would point out is I think one of the commission members asked Mr. Squire, you know, how often these level spreaders that are the outlets for the infiltration systems discharge. And he said, and I'm paraphrasing, but something to the effect that they only discharge during large storm events like the 100 year event. I'm looking at the stormwater report that's on your website tonight. And in fact, Infiltration system number one discharges um, for the two-year event. So it discharges for all the events they analyze, not just the extreme events. Um, infiltration system number two actually doesn't infiltrate at all. It just simply passes through that system and then into the level spreader and then into the wetlands. Um, so I'd very much like to have more opportunity to review this because the, the answers that were given tonight are in conflict with the... Uh, with the analysis that's presented in their September 8th stormwater, re September 6th stormwater report. Beyond that, we talked a little bit, or I heard a little bit of discussion about groundwater mounding. And the mounding analysis that's in the report indicates that the mound is going to extend out approximately seven, 70 feet from the edge of the infiltration system. And that puts it beyond the very steep fill slope. So you're going to have groundwater breaking out of the system and down the slope. Um, which is a violation of stormwater management policy. And the other thing I would say is that uh, the analytical method they used, um, which is a, and this gets into the weeds, and I, I'll try not to bore the commission because it gets very technical, but um, the stormwater management um, manual from Mass DEP requires you to use what's called a static, semi dynamic, or a dynamic analysis method. If you're, if you're claiming um, that infiltration systems are used to attenuate peak flows with which this project is doing. 
Um, and they did not use the proper analysis technique. And they also didn't derive the proper field data because to use the dynamic method, which they use in their HydroCAD report, they actually have to have field derived hydraulic conductivities um, to put into the model. And what they've done is they've assumed. Um, 30 seconds, please. All right. They've assumed numbers from the Rawls table. And in 30 seconds, all I can tell you is this is a very complicated analysis. The groundwater conditions there are, are in most cases less than two feet from the existing ground surface and do not give the consultants of the abutters a chance to review this this material um, in a more extended fashion um, uh, would be very unfortunate. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Jackie Balance. Thank you, thank you, Kevin. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, good, thank you. My, my, my gizmo here is not working 100%. Um, I'd wanna change the subject slightly for a minute at the, to say that I personally respect the integrity of members of the commission. I've seen you have to make hard decisions. I know that you, you're bound by some outdated ordinances and you, you absolutely do the best you can. I, I was so impressed tonight. I didn't know the, the commissioners knew so much about septic systems. Blew me away for, for volunteers to be that, why have that much knowledge? Finally, I will say this is a nice plan, 8 View Avenue for, for a community of starter homes, but I not here, not on the wetlands. I, I know a nice big lot on King Street where they could build this, it would go real good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else from the public? If not, I'll go back to uh, where I was with the commissioners. Are we ready to close? Do we need some more information? Um, there's been uh, one request for additional time for uh, analysis of the more recent um, uh, amendments and modifications to the application. Uh, what do you think? I think yes. this is really complicated and it does bear further uh, analysis. I was going to ask Sarah if the EPW had seen the latest change in the drainage calculations and whether they comment. So yes, DPW has been provided the the most recent stormwater report, um, and it, as Jeff acknowledged, there are still some final details to be worked out uh, regarding uh, recharge in that stormwater standard. And I would be more comfortable having that before us close. I agree with that myself. Yeah. No, I, and I, I also I agree with Mr. Gemma's uh, point that uh, since this revision is recently posted, that it would be, I feel it would be appropriate to give community members a bit more time to do some research on it and, and provide feedback. Sorry, Dave. Well, I, I, and, and the point that Mason was just making that it, you know, sometimes uh, we, Establishes a, a condition that we say, yeah, we're going to permit this, but before you can actually do anything, you have to complete X, Y, and Z. Um, in cases like this, I think it's best to have the completed application before us before we make that determination, rather than to try and establish that as a condition. Mm -hmm. As Mr. Gemma said, um, it's very complicated. It's a small area, but a lot of water. Let's get it right. So is that uh, the sense of the commission that we uh, continue the case? Is there a reason, uh, Jeff Squire, why that would represent a hardship for the applicant that we should consider? No, I don't think so. I think as long as we can limit the discussion to, to stormwater, um, you know, if there's any other items just to bring those up. But yeah, I think if we can limit the continuance just to, to the stormwater and final permit approval from the DPW and commission, that I don't see any reason can't agree with that. Um, I think invasives are still an issue. 
Yeah, well, I, th that's a discussion. I think if if we were to permit it, we might want, as uh, Mason was saying, a, a uh, uh, an additional mitigation element to be a, yeah. an invasive plan that goes farther than the current invasive plan. Yep. Yeah, I see. I see. Um, all right, someone want to make a motion then to continue? Uh, Sarah, when would that be tell? Uh, that would be, if, if two weeks is enough time, let's do September 26th at 5.30. I don't know what else is on the agenda at the moment. A couple okay, of but that we don't have any other items on the agenda for the 26th so far? Uh, we may, but they are all waiting for other regulatory input from the state. So I, I don't know what's ready, what will be ready to move forward at that point. So, okay, so we put put this up first. Uh, um, someone want to make a motion to uh, continue um, this until the 26th of September at 5.30. Uh, so moved. The hearing first. Mr. Mm -hmm. was it? I didn't hear that second. Did somebody second? I, I, I second, but someone else spoke. Okay. All right, made and seconded. Um, any further discussion? I, I would that. just like to, to agree with you, Kevin, that I appreciate the input from the community members as well as uh, Jeff's presentation, detailed presentation. I, yeah. I find it very helpful to yeah. have their, uh, their informed input. And uh, uh, I appreciate that uh, the that the comments in writing were, were very detailed and the photos were helpful to give us a sense of uh, over time what the site uh, is like and what the value of the area is to the to the neighborhood. So I just wanted to uh, back that up with my own position. <laughs> very good, thank you. We have a motion to continue made and seconded. Any further discussion? If not, uh, roll call, Sarah. Uh, roll call for the continuation. Melissa? Yes. Paul? Yes. Beth? Yes. Jen? Yes. David? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. Great. All right. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You,